Y'all like advice? <laughs> um, you know, some people think that the people that give advice, that's a sign of maturity. And uh, maybe the, by the amount of advice they give, I rather think that the, uh, it's by the quality of advice they give. Maybe you measure uh, um, maturity more. Um, and I just love some of this stuff. And uh, so I want to read some of these things to you. They just make me laugh. And if I'm the only one, then that's okay. <laughs> but this is, this is advice from young people. When I, when I say young people, I think the oldest one is 15. So, so I want to read some of these. These are really good. You might want to, if you got a notepad with you, you might want to get it out right now. Because there, there's one here. This is Hannah that says, When your dad asks you, do I look stupid, don't answer him. That's good advice. <laughs> That's real good advice. Uh, Randy, age nine, says, stay away from prunes. That's good advice. I can... <laughs> Emily, age 10, says, don't pull dad's finger when he asks you to. That's real good advice. As a father of three, godfather of one, and grandfather of five, I'll tell you, that's good advice. <laughs> when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair, says Tala, age 11. <laughs> Andrew, age 9, says, a puppy always has bad breath, even after eating a package of Tic Tacs. <laughs> Kelly, age 11, says, don't wear polka dot underwear with white shorts. <laughs> We've all done that, haven't we? I know you've done that, Bo, haven't you? You've, yeah. <laughs> um, Naomi, age 15, if you want a kitten, start out by asking for a horse. That's good advice. <laughs> um, Lauren, age 9, Sharpie markers are not good to use as lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, age 10, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. <laughs> Alicia, age 13, says when you get a bad grade in school, show it to your mom while she's on the phone. And then Ellen, age 8, says never try to baptize a cat. Um, I've tried to baptize a few cats in my day. That doesn't go well. Um, maturity is kind of subjective I mean it's how do you measure spiritual maturity and do we ever stop maturing spiritually I'm going to go uh, we're going to be in the first part of uh, Philippians a good part of the night this is Philippians 1 9 through 11 it's going to be in the back on the uh, screen this is Paul this is my prayer that you may that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. You know, this writing is very significant for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it's significant is it's one of Paul's lasts. Uh, he's writing from prison to a church he loves, and he knows he doesn't have a great deal of time left. And even at this point in his life, his prayer for the Philippians, at a time where a lot of us would be looking back at the past, thinking, you know, my time here is short, and we'd be reminiscing, and there's nothing wrong with reminiscing, but Paul, even though he knows his time is short, he's looking at what? He's looking at their future. He's looking at, at growth in love and knowledge and insight. I don't know if you've ever looked at Philippians 1 this way or not, but I think what Paul is praying for, for the church, in, for the Philippians, is, is spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity is not easy. It is a lifelong quest. It is a quest and a path that we must stay on to the finish because, listen to this, no one arrives spiritually. Nobody has arrived spiritually. Um, the call of every Christian, whether, whether they were 10 when they were baptized like I was, or, or whether they're 100 if they're capable, is to grow spiritually. Is to have a better relationship with God tomorrow than you do today, and a, and a better one a week from now than you do tomorrow. Um, 
And I believe, and, and some of you may disagree with me, and if you do, that's okay. But I think that in that quest to spiritual maturity, a lot of times there's going to be more questions than answers. Um, I don't know about y'all, but the more I grow spiritually, the more questions I have. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing because it reminds me that I never get to the point where I don't think I need to grow anymore. I think if I ever thought that I got to the point where I had all the answers, I'd probably quit growing spiritually. Um, and this is just me. I'm only talking about me, okay? Because this is some of the questions I ask myself to kind of gauge where I am spiritually. Why do I do the things I do, good and bad? Why do I do the things I do, good and bad? Um, why do I struggle with my relationship with this person or that person? Why am I so insensitive to my fellow man from time to time? Why am I fearful sometimes? Why do I struggle with forgiveness sometimes? Why can't I let the past go? And why do I keep going back and picking up baggage that I thought I'd left behind me? Spiritual maturity is not easy. Because I think in part, spiritual maturity demands that I have to be the most honest with myself. It demands that I take an honest assessment of myself, my, my strengths and my talents, yes. I told you this morning I have three. You all remember what one of them was? One of my three talents? I don't sweat much for a fat guy, right? You don't forget that. That's, that's good advice. <laughs> my strengths and my talents, yes, but also my weaknesses. The chinks in my armor, the things that, uh, that need work. Spiritual maturity may also require us to look at how others see us. Um, and I don't know how much importance you put on that, or we should put on that. But I know if I'm not seen in a good light by the community, I'm not going to be very effective. You know? Um, Arthur Frederick Bittner tells the story of his mom. And his mom was a very beautiful woman, and she really struggled with getting older and losing her beauty. And I want you to listen close to what he says about her. My mom was by no means heartless, but for who knows why, her heart was rarely touched at its deepest. To let her heart be touched at its deepest was a risk for reasons only known to her she was not willing to take. Being beautiful was my mother's business. It was her delight, and it earned her many dividends. But when she saw she had lost her beauty, it was like seeing a millionaire that was losing his fortune. So she took her name and number out of the phone book. With her looks gone, she felt like she had nothing else to offer the world. She simply checked out of the world. My mother locked herself up in an apartment and then in that apartment locked herself into one room of that apartment and then in that room finally just confined herself to a bed in that apartment until finally in that bed one morning a few summers ago she died in her sleep. She died trapped and cornered by a message in her past that all that mattered was her beauty. And she believed that. She not only believed it, she became it. Church family, and this is something that you've been told since you were probably uh, really young. But boy, sometimes our lives don't reflect it. It's not what on the, it's on the outside that matters. It's who you are on the inside that matters very much. And it's a question that a spiritually mature person asks themselves often. Who 
am I? Who am I deep down inside in the places in my heart where really only I and God know? Who are you deep down here? Because I believe a fair segment of Christianity is trapped, just like Bittner's mother, trapped into believing that they have peaked. Maybe not physically, although I went golfing this afternoon with Rebels and I'm pretty convinced I've peaked physically. (laughs) But they've peaked, they feel like they've peaked spiritually. And no one peaks spiritually. No one. Spiritual maturity means I'm constantly growing closer to God. No one peaks. No one gets to a point where they've arrived or they've gone as far as they can go. I think when you get to a point where you think that you've gone as far as you can go or that you've peaked, you're actually going backwards and you don't know it. Paul says, I'm going to read it again, my prayer is that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. God's plan for everyone in this room is to have a better relationship with Him tomorrow than you do today. No one has arrived. There's going to be a day where the only thing that's going to matter, the only thing that's going to matter is your relationship with God. Not all the things that the world defines us with. All the things the world defines us with are going to amount to a hill of beans. And the only thing that's going to matter is your relationship with God. Spiritual maturity and And nurturing our relationship with God should be the quest of every Christian. And I'm going to try to real quickly go through three things tonight that uh, may help you um, with that. Um, First is we learn from the things that we don't know. Do you learn from anything that you don't know? Well, you know, we have a society that has to know. You know, that's why, you know, that's that's why there's a 24-7 news channel. Because people have got to know. And science will sit there and tell you, there's an answer to everything. And we're going to find it because we got to know. Our society is, believes in, quick answers and quick fixes and self-help books. And when you get that figured out, you're going to have a wonderful life, right? But without God, all these things are the equivalent of band-aids on a corpse. Like putting a band-aid on things that are passing away. Sometimes we need to think about the questions in our heart and maybe not be so quick to look for the answer. The band-aid answer. I've got to tell you, at 10, when I was baptized, I had a lot of questions. But not as many as I had at 25 when I was married. I had more spiritual questions. And then when I went into ministry at 35, guess what? I didn't have more answers. I had more questions. And now, I would hope to think that my relationship with God is, is better than it has been right now. And I have way more questions than I had when I entered the ministry at 35, when I got married at 25, and when I was baptized at 10. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Matter of fact, I think that's rather the way it's supposed to be because at the times of my life that I've had more questions than answers are the times that I felt closest to the Lord. Sometimes instead of seeking the answers so hard, God may want you to ask yourself, why am I asking myself this question? I think in the process you're going to learn something about yourself and you're going to learn something about God. My grandma Strickland, man, I wish I'd written down everything my grandma Strickland told me 
but I wasn't honestly paying attention a lot of the time when I should. One of the things she said is, the things we don't know about God can teach us as much as the things we do know. And I didn't even know what that meant <laughs> when she said it. But what I found out, it means I'm not in control. I can't know everything. I can't control everything. I'm just going to have to trust God on some things. In my opinion, the mature Christian needs to linger on what they don't know from time to time. I think it keeps me humble. It reminds me who's really in control of my life and who I really belong to, which is God. Paul again in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, your relationship with one another, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being of the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. You know, uh, you, you think about when Jesus came to earth. Uh, you know, we're kind of coming up on, on that, that time of year where the world will start talking about the birth of Christ. And how humble and meager and, and lowly it was to be born in an animal feeding trough to, uh, to, to a couple who were kind of married. <laughs> in Jewish, they were you know, part way through it. There wasn't a parade. There wasn't, there wasn't uh, you know, what the Royals have had a couple babies now. And man, it is all they talk about on TV when the Royals have a baby, isn't it? What well, another that for Jesus. It was very humble. It was very meager. But Jesus could have came and he could have been full of himself. You know? If anybody had a reason to come and be full of himself, it was definitely the Son of God. But he didn't come that way. Matter of fact, Jesus did just the opposite. He didn't come full of himself, he came and emptied himself out. I want to be like that. Not full of myself, but willing to empty myself. Be a servant. And man, how many times I failed at that, I couldn't tell you. Don't be afraid to ponder on the questions a little bit. And why am I asking this question? It may tell you a lot about you and it may tell you a lot about God. Number two is we learn from our fears. The things we are afraid of are very significant when trying to access spiritual maturity. And some of the fears we might have in common. You know, we may have, some of us may have a fear of death. Some of us may have a fear of public speaking. Uh, there's, there's a survey that says there's more people afraid of public speaking than there are of death. Maybe there's a fear of rejection. Maybe it's a fear uh, of trust or trusting someone. I want you to listen to Paul's prayer. This is Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. It's a little lengthy, so you're going to have to stick with me. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. And now if you're afraid of something tonight, I want you to listen to this right here. If you're afraid of anything, I want you to start listening right here. Okay? I got your attention. I pray that out of His glorious riches may be strength within you and power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses, surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do measurably more than all we ask or could imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, and amen. Whatever you're afraid of tonight, 
I want you to deep six it right there. I want you to give it to God right now. Right there. Tony, I don't have all the answers. That's okay. Trust God. Trust Him. Give it to Him. There's nothing more to fear. Jesus offered Himself up so there would be no more to be afraid of. And then lastly, the, the third thing I think that when we're talking about spiritual maturity, definitely knowing the truth needs to be in there. Maybe it needed to be first. You know, I, I've went through a lot of stages in my spiritual development where I, I've thought about what is the truth really? What's the truth? Tom Cruise said you can't handle the truth. You can handle the truth. I used to think the truth was like a piece of furniture. Like a real nice sofa. <laughs> and, and, and you could decorate your life up with the truth and you could admire it from a distance and, and you could even sit on it for a little while. Not do anything. I don't think that's what the truth is anymore. I think the truth is an adventure. I think the truth is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think the truth is exciting. I think the truth is finding God on your worst day. I think the truth is not just doing what's right, but the truth is a lifelong journey with God. The truth is a journey into deeper understanding and deeper relationship. And that relationship starts with baptism. Um, if you've not been baptized, again, I, I'm never going to apologize for uh, uh, at the end of every time I speak asking if you want to be baptized, be baptized. Um, that is the beginning of your journey a lifelong journey with God and if you realize that and you realize that you desperately need forgiveness and you believe and you will and confess Jesus Christ to the world then you know enough to start your walk with the Lord now there are people who disagree with me on that and again, that's okay. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. But I believe that's what you got to know. That's what you got to know. That I'm not going to heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not getting my sins forgiven without being immersed with Him in baptism. I can't do it myself. You know, I don't know what you came in the room tonight thinking what spiritual maturity is I know when, at some point in my life I used to probably think that uh, um, someone who quoted a lot of scripture that was a sign of a, a spiritually mature person and it very well may be that they are spiritually mature but that alone does not make you spiritually mature I think you become a spiritually mature person when you start living the life that God wants you to live and doing the things that God wants you to do and having the relationship with Him that He wants you to have. He, he created you for an eternal relationship with Him. And then, then when we mess that up, He sent His Son to die so we could have an eternal relationship with Him. That's what He wants. He wants a relationship with you that's going to go from now till tomorrow to heaven and into eternity. But you've got to want it too. You've got to want it too. Let's stand and sing.